Well, hello, fellow believers in Messiah, the children of the highest, members of the house of God. We're right in the season of Passover, just a few weeks before, and that's all about God opening up the way to salvation. It's a, an anniversary commemoration remembrance of the day that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on Golgotha for the sins of the world, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, is what John the Baptist said, John 1, 29. The sins of the world, not just the sins of the Jews, the sins of Israel, the sins of those who are good people, but the sins of the world. And he literally made the way open possible to all men and women, children all around the world. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you've believed in the past. It doesn't matter what nation you're part of, what color your skin is. Um, if you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're on your way to salvation. So he died for anyone in the world who will receive him and do what he says, regardless of your past. It's also the anniversary of Israel being delivered from the land of Egypt as slaves and delivered to become the people of God. They had to march through the wilderness for a while, as you know. And the blood that they splashed on their doors, the doorposts and the lintels, that particular blood pointed to the firstborn Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah. Messiah and Christ, by the way, both mean anointed. Be sure, by the way, to read my recent blog, <clears throat> Who Really Killed Christ? If your answer is it's the Jews or the Romans or all of us by our sins, uh, you really need to read that because none of those really is the correct answer. The father or head of each house, house was to pick a lamb for the Passover on the 10th of Aviv or Nisan. Nisan means new beginning or something like that. Four days before Passover. The Bible speaks of a day for a year. I'm, I'm, I mean a day for a thousand years. And so Christ was foreordained to be God's lamb to be slain for a thousand years. The 10th of Aviv to the 14th of Aviv, which is Passover, was four days. So going back with a day equals a thousand years, then 4,000 years before he died, Christ indeed was pre-selected, foreordained. In fact, even before the foundation of the world, it says, and I think that one's 1 Peter 1.20. And then when Adam and Eve sinned, that, was the, that became the foundation of the world, and he was as good as crucified at that point. Passover remembers this titanic battle between God and Satan. A titanic battle. And Satan did get him crushed in his ankles and, and heels, very painful area there as he was crucified and along with other places where nails were put in, I'm saying. But our Savior crushed the head as prophesied in Genesis 3, crushed the head of Satan, the snake, the serpent, the dragon of old. Any of you back in Asia, please don't have anything to do with dragons. So once again, welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of this website, and welcome. Thanks for coming. I'd love to hear your comments. And remember to check out the blogs as well as the sermons, audio sermons as well. We'll be adding some audio sermons as well as video sermons. Today we're going to clean up some cobwebs about being saved and how we get to the point of living in God's righteousness, confident of being there at the end, saved confident that God indeed will finish what he started in us, as Philippians 1.6 says. Today and next time, we'll also definitely talk about a lot of things uh, about our part in that salvation. I'll talk about today, first of all, are we saved now or later? And then we'll talk about our part at the end of this and then going into next time and how Yeshua, Jesus, how he plays such a big part not just in the death of forgiving our sins, but in his life, in living with us, in us, and us in him. So we can be there at the end. The first Passover I remember was in the Philippines. 
My father was a missionary there, an evangelist missionary. He had a Bible school. He had a, he had church. He had a, a foster home. I think he had a nursing home as well. And I loved growing up in the Philippines. I was six years old at the time I'm talking about. My dad was away. My mom was going to, she, at this point, she believed in Passover and the Sabbath, the holy days and all that. And my father, a Protestant, did not. But he was away, and so she did a Passover in front of me and my brother and two sisters, older sisters. I was the youngest. And she explained to us what she was doing with the unleavened bread and the small vial of red wine. Um, some people use grape juice. The Bible does say Jesus spoke about not drinking again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. Well, certainly grape juice is also fruit of the vine. I always use red wine, though. Always do. And I think I can show that that was what was meant in the Bible. But anyway, so what does the blood of Jesus do for us? And are you saved now? Or do you insist that you're only being saved? You don't know if you're going to be yet. Not until the very end, because it does talk about those who are faithful to the end, endure to the end, shall be saved. Okay, so we'll get, we'll get to that too. We're going to definitely get to that. I want to say, first of all, that we please understand that the Passover sacrifice of Jesus, I also say Yeshua a lot. That's his Hebrew name, uh, means salvation. That would have been the name he used in Acts. I think it's either 24 or 26. He, he speaking in Hebrew, said, my name is Yeshua. Your Bible will say Jesus because it doesn't, you know, it, it, they translate it. But anyway, he would have said Yeshua, that the sacrifice of Yeshua pays for our own sin debt. The wages of sin is death, so we owed something. We owed our life. We know by now that he paid for that. He forgave that, covered it, washed them away in his blood. His blood also redeemed us. So now we belong to God. He paid the price, the ultimate price, the highest price you could pay, his own life, the very life of the Son of God, and reconciled us to God and removed the wrath God had for us because of the sins we had. But there was more. Besides forgiving your sins and my sins, God also uh, used this death and blood of Christ to remove the curse of Adam's sin. When Adam sinned, God placed that separation and that curse on every single human being that would ever be born. Some of you don't accept that doctrine, but it's okay. It's in the Bible. Uh, so let's, let's read it in Romans 5. You might want to start reading, if you have your Bible, from verse 12. But David even said in Psalm 51, verse 5, In sin did my mother conceive me. That makes no sense unless he's saying I was born, I was conceived in sin, under the penalty of sin by Adam, the curse on Adam on all humanity. So Romans 5, verses 12 to 19, I'm going to read 18 to 19. Therefore, by the way, Romans 5, 17 speaks of the gift of God's righteousness to us. So many of you know it intellectually, intellectually but haven't accepted that, that you have the gift of God's righteousness on you right now. You look at yourself and you say, how is that possible? I had too many faults. In faith, we believe things we haven't seen yet. You know, faith is the evidence of things not seen. But you keep believing and you will see it. But anyway, Romans 5, 18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, through one man's offense, uh, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. The one man is Adam. And judgment, condemnation came to us all, it says. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that's Yeshua, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification. That's being made, made right with God again, righteous again. Uh, justification of life. Verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. <clears throat> Notice whose righteous acts result in us being declared righteous. You read that again. So by one man's obedience, many 
will be made righteous. By one man's righteous act, verse 7, 18, uh, the free gift came to all men. So you see what I'm saying here? Uh, whose righteous acts results in us being seen as righteous and, and all that. Notice verse 19 again. Uh, it's hard to believe when you honestly look at yourself, but that's what it says. Believe it. When it comes, I think so many of us really labor under the worry of will I make it to God's kingdom? Will I ever be qualified? Will I, will I, will I ever be good enough? Stop looking at yourself. I just read you the verses that by one man's righteous act, many who accept that will be made righteous. So when it comes to faith, we have to wait for it sometimes. God told Abraham that he'd be the father of many, many nations. And by the time he was 99, he still didn't have a single child through Sarah. But he didn't get his first real son till age 100. He had to wait and wait and wait. And he's getting older and older, and the evidence is it's not going to work so well. But believe it, accept it, and it happens. <clears throat> so we need to activate, learn how. I'm going to cover that, the last part of this sermon, and into the part two, how we activate the perfect life of Christ in us. Very important you understand that concept. Because you see, I, and I know you two, need a Savior. I am just too weak, spiritually. To do it on my own. Even with God's Spirit, as I'll show you towards the end here, Paul said he couldn't do it. Even with God's Spirit, he was frustrated. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? So we'll talk about all that too. I need a Savior. I still stumble into sins often, too often, as Paul said. I still have lousy attitudes. I still have unkind, unkindness, being judgmental, being unloving, and all kinds of things. So I need a Savior. You do too, I bet. I know you do. So if I'm asked if I'm saved already, I'm going to say absolutely. And God will be with me through Christ and me in Christ and through the Holy Spirit and complete the work that he started in me. I have total confidence that God was telling the truth in Philippians 1, 6, that he will complete what he started. There are scriptures that say we are saved now. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 and 10, verse 8 and 9, For you have been, we have been saved by grace, through faith. Have been, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Okay, and I'll get into verse 10, which is critical to understanding our role. And then uh, Titus 3, verse 4 and 5, let's read it now. Titus 3, verse 4 and 5, When the kindness... And the love of God, our Savior. Notice it's calling God our Savior here. Toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Okay. The love of God appeared to us, not by works of righteousness we have done. But according to his mercy, he, God, saved us through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. While I'm on, on that, I just want to point out to you that uh, God, our Savior, is not just Jesus Christ. God is also our Savior. And this is one of many verses. In my notes, I'll put more in. This is one of many that speaks of God being our Savior, working through Jesus. It was his plan, after all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. But then, okay, so that's talking about saved. He says, he saved, past tense. He saved us. Ephesians 2, we have been saved. Now, Paul wouldn't be saying these things if it's not true. If it's not true for, or, you know, of course it's true. If we all have to wait to see if we'll be given eternal life or not at the very end, then Paul shouldn't have said that, but he did say that. Okay, then other verses speak of us being saved. Several, about four or five, three, three I, I see. 1 Corinthians 1.18, I'll read, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Finally, those who are faithful to the very end, those who endure to the end, shall be saved. We know those verses. 
Matthew 24, 13, and so on. And there are several if scriptures, like if we abide to the very end and endure and so forth. I think 1 Corinthians 15, 2 is one of those. We have to remain faithful to the very end. So when Christ returns, he's going to have with him, Revelation 17, 14 says, those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. So the, the Bible says you and I, if we've repented and received God's Spirit and immersed in water, uh, can say we have been saved, we can say we're being saved, and we can say we shall be saved. So if someone asks you, are you saved? What are you going to say? Based on Scripture, I'm going to say, yeah, of course. Of course I am. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I'm very confident that Jesus Christ living in me and the Father working to complete what he started in me will make sure that I'm there at the very end. I'm probably going to answer it something like that. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work or has begun a good work in you will complete it. Confident of that until the day, that, that's the return of Jesus Christ. And remember Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, Jesus is the author, that's the one starting it, and the finisher of our faith. He finishes it. It's his job. He's called, that's his job to do that. I think he does good jobs. I think he will. I think he will complete it. I think a way I can illustrate this is if someone's drowning in, in, at the beach or in a lake or something, and people see him drowning and a lifeguard sees him, a lifeguard gets either in a boat or swims out or let's say a, a, a jet ski, a sea dude jet ski to go save him. He's drowning. He's in trouble. He's going to die. He's going under from, in, from time to time. The lifeguard gets there, jumps in, pulls him out, drags him, you know, the way they do it. This way, you know, they, they pull him over to the boat or the jet ski. And is he saved? Has he been saved? Everyone watching on the shore saying, clapping their hands, hallelujah, what, wonderful. Yes, he's been saved. He's now on the jet ski or whatever he came out, came out with, boat or whatever. And now they're uh, on the way back to shore. And someone at shore might say, isn't it wonderful he's being saved? He had been saved, but now he's, on, now he's on his way back to shore. He's being saved. He's not on the shore yet, but he's going to be there. Finally, he comes to shore, comes out of the jet ski or boat or whatever it was. And now, yes, he endured to the end and he is saved. He's delivered finally safely. What did the saved man do? Well, he cooperated with the lifeguard. He didn't fight him, or sometimes people aren't fighting them in their mind, but they're so nervous and scared of what's going on that they're moving their arms about, flailing and wailing around. And finally, uh, the lifeguard just has to say, sit still, let me, let me take care of this. You're getting in my way. <laughs> okay, so, and who was his savior? His savior was the lifeguard, of course. In fact, while being pulled out of water, drowning people often are told to just lay there. Let me do it. So there you see, has been saved, being saved, and shall be saved. I need a Savior in the same way. <clears throat> now we have faith in Him. That's His job to save me. I think He's going to do a good job. We just read that. that it's up to Him. And I mean moment by moment saving as well. I don't mean just saving me from sins I repented of 50 years ago. But sins that still happen or temptations and trials and tests and depressions and things, I still need him saving me. Another illustration uh, was of the three verb tenses. Use someone in a plane knowing the plane's going to go down and he jumps out, grabs a parachute somehow and jumps out, and remembers to pull the ripcord and he finally lands on the ground safely. The problem I see with that illustration is there is no savior. He saved himself. And I think that also is underneath, that illustration is underneath the problem many people have. We like to be in control. 
we like to have something to do, do it yourself salvation. And be careful with that because I, I don't think that's a good illustration. I, I, I get the point. Uh, with our fleshly nature, we're too flawed to save ourselves. We just are. Now, who is your savior? I think most of you would say Jesus Christ, and that's correct. But it's not a complete answer. I want you to also know fully well, consciously well, Jesus is your savior, yes, but so is God the Father. God the Father is also your savior. We just read that, I believe, in Titus chapter 3, God our Savior, right? And uh, that's very, very true. God so loved the world. He's the one who put it all in motion. He's the one who worked with Christ. Christ implemented the plan. He's the one who decided to call you. No one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father in heaven calls him to me. God the Father leads you to repentance, Romans 2, 4 says, and then to obedience to Christ. Yes, we must obey. Hebrews 5, 9 says, having been perfected, he, Christ, became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. To all who obey him. There are many more verses that show that God the Father is also Savior, and I'll put those in the notes. <clears throat> One is 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 and 2.3. Um, so, so you can look those up. <clears throat> They're acting as one Savior together, so unified. Remember, Jesus often spoke of, my Father and I are one, and he prayed that we would all be one. In Acts 4, verse 11 and 12, when they were being questioned about who healed this man and so forth, uh, Peter says in Acts 4, 11 and 12 that this is the stone which is was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We must be saved. No other name given under heaven. So what's that telling us? Only the name of Jesus Christ working together as one with God the Father. That's our Savior. Not you, not me. Not anybody else. Too many of you, perhaps even, have used Philippians 2.12 to feel like you have part of a role of saving yourself. Because in the English version, the King James, New King James, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. God's left it up to you. No. Read the verse before that and the beginning of verse 12. He's saying you guys were very faithful to keep working hard when I was with you. All he's saying is keep working hard, though we're not with you. Because, then he goes to verse 13, which is not often read, because God is working in you. God is working in you. Verse 13, both to want to do, that's to will, and to do for his good pleasure. So please don't use Philippians 2.12 to show that we are supposed to help save ourselves. No, no, no. Uh, you're not 5% Savior and God's 95. No. He's 100%. He's the only one. There's no other name under heaven by which we may be saved. No other name by which we must be saved, he says. Now, salvation is supernatural. It's God's work. Anything supernatural is by God. It's not your work. It's not mine. We are to cooperate with God. We are to let God work. We are to follow his leading. And we are to call out to him for help. But let him do it. Let him do it in us. I'll really hit that hard at the end of this sermon and mostly at the next sermon. I am to ask him many times a day. God, Paul says, constantly pray. Be praying constantly without ceasing. So what I do is, as much as I can remember to do it, is getting, I'm getting better at it. 15, 20, 25 times a day, I just speak to Christ. I speak to God the Father and just Maybe a minute, minute and a half short bursts of prayer. Just say, sometimes they're prayers of gratitude or praise. Sometimes they're prayers of, oh, help me, please. I'm so, I'm getting so tired and discouraged or, or I'm, I'm not being the kind of husband I want to be or whatever it is. And I know, Yeshua, you're a perfect husband. You come and live in me. Be my life. Be me, be, let me. 
be the right husband by you and me. I'm being tempted with this or that, or I wasn't very loving here and there. So all through the day, 15, 20, 25 times, I'm calling out to God the Father and to Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah. <clears throat> okay, having said that, now let's move on. In the new, now first of all, in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, everybody focused on, of course, coming out of Egypt, uh, leaving Pharaoh, um, death of the firstborn of Egypt, all of that. At Passover, make sure we are focusing on Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So 4,000 years ago, indeed, he was as good as slain. So look what Jesus said in Luke 22, uh, verse 19. First of all, he took the cup and gave thanks and take this and divide it among yourselves. Uh, I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Uh, then verse 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body broke, uh, given for you, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember me when you do Passover. Don't spend so much time with Egypt and the, and the lambs and the blood of the house there, except to say, and you, you should, that all of this pointed to Christ. All of that pointed to him. When you rehearse, when you have Passover, re rehearse his last supper. Make that the thing you talk about. That's what he said. When you take my body and this unleavened bread, remember me. Do it in remembrance of me, not Pharaoh or Israel or Moses. So that's what we do in the new covenant. He now frees us from Satan's grasp, pictured by Pharaoh and his armies, and brings us out of darkness into his wonderful light. It all pointed to the Lamb, Yeshua. Now, for much of the rest of the time today and into the next sermon, I want to start focusing on the work Jesus does in the lives of each of us. I want to point out, first of all, I'm sure there'll be things you, there'll be new for you or good reminders or something. So I hope you really, really take note. A twofold process, the more in what Jesus did for us. The first of the twofold process is the well-known one that he died for our sins to pay the penalty for us and take away the death requirement. It requires the death of an innocent. Christ was innocent to pay the death of the guilty. And being the very Son of God, his one life covers the life of, is worth more than all the lives put together. And not only did his blood wash away the sins, but um, technically his blood, uh, it, it, it reconciled us to God, took away the wrath, but the blood was not what technically saved us, as you'll see. It, got, it, got, it set the stage for that forgave the sin, it reconciled you to God, took away his wrath, cleansed you, washed you. Now you can come before God and receiving Jesus Christ, believing in him, did, did some other things too. If you read John 1, verses 10 to 13, John 1, verses 10 to 13, talking about Jesus, he came into the world, the world was made through him, the world didn't know him, they didn't even accept him. But verse 12, as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So it makes that possible as well. And to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. So accepting the blood of the lamb also removed God's wrath and can also grant us eternal life as we believe in him. So I want to read 1 John 5, verses 11 to 13. I'm speaking rapidly because there's so much to cover. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. So when we take Christ into our lives, we then also have it. He who has the Son, because eternal life is in the Son, he said here. He who has the Son, therefore, has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And there's still preachers out there talking about, we don't have eternal life yet. You know, I could die. Yeah, I could die. But I have that seed of eternal life in me. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now remember, too, that the blood of Jesus not only covered your sins, 
but they also covered the sins that, uh, of Adam, sin of Adam, that was placed as a blemish, as a curse on all mankind in Romans 5, 18, 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, that's Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, one man's righteous act, the free gift, came to all men. I read that earlier, but we need to read it again. So you understand that Christ's blood covers your sins. What I'm saying here, it covered also the, uh, the stain, the, the condemnation from Adam's sin. So we don't have that anymore either. Both are removed. Sin was accounted to us, imputed to us by Adam's sin in some way. And now in the same way, those who believe in Jesus and obey his will will also be accounted righteous. You might, I do recommend you hear my sermon, Receiving God's Own Righteousness by Faith. Receiving God's Righteousness by Faith. You can put down in the search bar God's Righteousness and it'll probably come up. So what's our responsibility then? This next section in Colossians is such a good one. I had a good friend out west uh, send this out to me, a man, and as well as a, 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 it was sent to me by someone else as well. And it was a very good, very good passage. Let's read it. Colossians 1, 9 to 14. Some of our responsibilities, some of which I'll get into much more detail next sermon. Colossians 1, 9 to 14. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, don't cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Do you pray that way about your own, that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will? All wisdom and understanding, that you may work, walk worthy of the Lord. Once we're called, given God's Holy Spirit, and are being saved, God wants us to live in a way that we're walking worthy of the Lord. Uh, we're seen as people of God, children of God. Okay, walk worthy of the Lord, verse 10, Colossians 1.10, fully pleasing Him. When you know you're not fully pleasing Him, that's when you repent again. That's when you call out to Yeshua, I need help. I'm heading in a way that I know is not going to please you. Being fruitful in every good work. Now notice this, you're, someone here is being very fruitful. And we're going to read in Philippians later on that all this fruit of righteousness is by Jesus Christ, not by you. You can try to be fruitful. You can try to walk worthy of the Lord, but you're going to slip up. You need him doing it. And it will look like you doing it, but it's him doing it. Philippians 1.11, the fruits of righteousness by Jesus Christ. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Now remember these phrases, fruitful in good work and, and um, fully pleasing him, walking worthy of him. So remember that good works, doing works of the law, will not save you for all eternity. Romans 3, verses 22 to 28, is very clear about that. Verse 28, it just very clearly says that uh, by works of the law, you, no one is justified. So it's got to be more than that. But on the other hand, if you're doing good works, you're, you'll have a good reward because we're rewarded by our works. Eternal life is not a reward. Eternal life is a gift. Rewards are based on what we do do, and they're wonderful. So you do want to have good works so you have good reward. It's even the first, I think it's the second or third John, that says, go for the full reward. So many of us, though, wonder and worry, am I going to qualify? Am I ever going to qualify to be in God's kingdom? Am I ever going to make it? Look at Colossians 1, verse 12, as we keep reading here. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. King James says something about being meat for something. I, I, anyway, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Father has qualified you. So yes, we should 
continue to work with God and take it very seriously, very soberly, but he has qualified you. Verse 13, he has delivered us. Past tense, qualified, past tense, delivered, past tense. Look at the end of Romans 8. It's all past tense. He has foreordained or predestined and saved and glorified because God speaks to the things which are not as if they already are. He sees the end from the beginning. Verse 13, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom, conveyed, past tense, put us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 2, I think it's verse 6, says He's caused us to be seated. might be verse 4, but Ephesians 2 is not in my notes. Ephesians 2, He's caused us to be seated with Him, with Christ, in the heavenlies. So, I mean, you're right there as far as God's concerned when we have the Holy Spirit and He's qualified us and delivered us into the power of to the kingdom of, of, of his son. By the way, we talk about the kingdom of God. Right here, it does say Colossians 1.13, there's such a thing as the kingdom of his son because the father has conveyed and bequeathed and shared that, given it over to Jesus Christ, who in turn will share it with us. Wonderful, huh? Colossians 1, 21 to 23. Or 22, anyway. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he's reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, Christ, to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Are you holy, blameless, above reproach right now? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. You just have to believe that that's, and I'm going to show you how that is happening. It has everything to do with Yeshua. Everything to do with Him. So when God sees you, He doesn't see your stumblings. He sees the perfection of Jesus Christ covering you. Remember His bride. He sees His bride as without spot or blemish. Are you without spot or blemish? Will you ever be able to take out all your spots and blemishes? No, you won't. Paul said he couldn't. Are you better than Paul? See what I'm saying? And the spots and blemishes, the no spots, no, no problems, is because our life becomes Jesus Christ. And then he goes on here. So um, notice the big if coming up here. He'll present you holy, blameless, above reproach you'll see what vital role Jesus plays in all of this. Verse 23, if indeed, if indeed you continue in the faith, you can't leave the faith, grounded, steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, and which I, Paul, became a minister. If you continue in the faith. Like I mentioned in my sermon on once saved, always saved, how it's such a dangerous error if you do the Hebrew 6 thing, Hebrew 6, verse 4 to 6, and in spite of having received the Holy Spirit, in spite of having been enlightened, if you walk away and leave all that, that's it. So we do have to endure to the end. But I'm going to be, I want to be a sheep in his fold, constantly following him, watching him. And if I go astray, he's going to come looking for me. I've got that assurance. And I've got that assurance that he will finish what he started in me. He's already qualified me and you, already qualified us for his kingdom. All right. He's already qualified us. And so be aware of that. It's what Christ has done in us. We're qualified because you're looking at Christ, not yourself. It's not any righteousness we have done, but we have to continue in the faith. And yes, salvation technically is a process. But scripture says repeatedly, that we now have already been saved. Just got to make myself a little note here. But if someone asks you or me if we've been saved, am I really supposed to say no, not yet? When Paul says, yes, yes, we have been saved. You have been saved. 
God inspired that. God inspired the have been and being saved and will be saved. So just explain it that way. Yes, we have been saved. And so I'm not going to deny my God. I'm going to be there at the end. I'm going to keep seeking him. And he will finish what he started in me. Yes, I have been saved. Now, you're saved by the life of a Savior, right? So Jesus' death did a lot, forgave our sins, washed away the God's wrath. Now let's hear the second part of what he did. Remember I said it's a two-stage saving. The first stage is the part I've been talking about by his blood. All of these wonderful things that he did for us, reconciled, removed the wrath, paid the penalty, washed away the sins, etc. Now the second part we find in Romans 5, verse 10. The second part is not by his death. It's not by his blood. Some of you know this well, but I think many of you probably don't. So listen carefully, Romans 5.10. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, we've covered that, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What happened after Jesus was crucified? He was dead. He was put in the tomb for three days and three nights. Then he was resurrected. They've never found the body because the tomb is empty. Hallelujah. <clears throat> They've never found the body. Most people think of being saved by the blood and death of Christ, but actually we're saved by his life. This is understanding we must understand and see. How does it work? Well, this is the core of our part in the solution is going to him, inviting him into your life, letting him rule, letting him be your Lord and master, surrendering to him. Let him be your life now. So the second fold of the saving process is saved by the life of Christ has everything to do with our part in the saving process. I also asked Jesus to be my life. In my short burst of prayers, besides my on-my-knees prayers in the morning and at night and so on, the short burst of prayers, please come to me. Please be my life. Be my mind. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Renew my mind in you. I'm still being tempted by this or that. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> But I'm still being tempted. Please give me strength to not have any desire for anything that's not of you. Please give me that strength. I want my life to now be Christ, not my old dead weak self. Then Christ starts and finishes the work that he started in me, the author and finisher. I want Galatians 2.20 to start being my life. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, saved by his life. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, gave himself for me. Make it personal, love me. You know when they talk about the Passover, 1 Corinthians 5.7, Paul wrote there to the Corinthians, Christ our Passover. Not just Christ the Passover, Christ our Passover. This is the part I'm going to focus on for much of the rest of this time and also in uh, the next sermon. Let's let Paul explain how Christ becomes our life. I hope I have time to get through all of this. If not, we'll finish it next time. You guys know Romans 7 pretty well. If not, maybe pause this and read it slowly yourself. Romans 7 verses 14 to 25 and then all the way to the end. Um, Paul is saying here, I have the Holy Spirit, but I'm still stumbling. He says it several times. Let's read it. Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual. I am carnal. I am carnal, sold under sin. Romans 7, 15. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I want to do, will to do, I don't practice that. But what I hate, that I do. Boy, at least ask God to, first of all, get you to the point where you hate sin. If you're still finding that you're enjoying getting drunk, enjoying adultery, enjoying watching movies you shouldn't, 
enjoying bad language, enjoying being with wrong company. Something's wrong. Ask God to help you hate what's wrong. If then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it's no longer I who do it. If I did something terribly sinful and said, but that wasn't me. That was the old me. That was my old flesh who did that. You'd say, wake up, Philip, smell the coffee, take responsibility. But Paul here is saying, it's no longer I who's doing it, but sin that dwells in me. We have an old nature that's still there. And we have a new nature from God. I know that in me, that's in my flesh, nothing good dwells. He had the Holy Spirit, that's good. But he says, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present, to want to do it, but how to perform what's good, I don't always find. I don't find it. The good I want to do, I don't do, but the evil I, evil I don't want to do, I practice. The evil. To me, this is sadly comforting that even the Apostle Paul struggles with sin. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells in me. He says it again twice now. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are now a new creation in Christ. But we still have the old nature. We still have the old heart as well. We're still having the old sinful nature. But plus now we have the new heart that loves God. The old heart didn't. We now have the new creation. So how does Paul explain how he's going to defeat this? How he's going to win this battle? Having the Holy Spirit wasn't enough. Obviously, he says that. Romans 7, 21 to 25, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wants to do good. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me? Who will save me? From this body of death, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So in anguish he cries out, who shall deliver me from this body of death? So the blood of Jesus washes away our sins and past sins. And even as we sin, 1 John 1, 7 says he continues to cleanse. He cleanses us as we sin. And that's just past sins. But as we sin and, and confess, repent, and confess them to God, um, he continues to cleanse. But we still keep on sinning from time to time. You do, I do. It's the life of Christ which will deliver us, he says, from that old self. That's more than just the Holy Spirit. It's the very life of Christ. God manifesting himself inside of us by Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Yeshua said that God wants us to be perfect. Be you, therefore, perfect, complete, fully complete, mature. Perfect is the word used in most translations. Be you, therefore, perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And I have a whole sermon on God's perfection for us. Look up the word perfection. You've got to hear that. He also said, our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And we, but we keep failing. We keep failing. So what happened is God also bequeaths and uh, what's the word there? God also uh, gives us his, his uh, righteousness, imputes to us his righteousness, but we keep failing. Now get this. If we were able to be perfect by ourselves after our sins in the past even were forgiven, if going forward we could do it ourselves and maybe Christ died in vain. Of course, he had to die anyway for even our past sins. But this is why the sermons on God's perfection and God's righteousness that he credits us with are very, very critical that you learn and accept that what the Bible teaches is something we must accept. That I now have, whether I see it all the time or not, I now have God's righteousness. We need God's righteousness because our own will never attain to his perfect perfection to his perfect righteousness. Yeshua said, in fact, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
John 15, verse 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and all of that, and, and, and the branches that, that don't produce fruits, he takes away, and those that do, he prunes, and then he says, but you've got to be in me. So let's read that in John 15, verse 4, because this is the key to what Paul was saying in Jesus' own words. You can do nothing, Jesus said, apart from him. Paul said, but with him, we can do all things through Christ. John, no, no, Philippians, what is it? Philippians 4, 13. But too many times, too many of us still try to have our own righteousness. John 15, verse 4 and 5. This will be a good introduction then for next time too. We've got to end here soon. Abide in me. Hang in there with me. This is the key. This is the key to us being saved and being righteous. Abide in me and I knew the branch can... And he said earlier, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself... You cannot do it unless it abides in the vine. That's him. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So who's producing the fruits? He says you and I can't produce anything. This is key to understanding. This is key to understanding Philippians 1.11, the fruits of righteousness by Jesus Christ. Not by you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We just read that. Unless you abide in me. I'm, I'm, here it says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Okay. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. We have to abide in Christ. This, we have to understand this whole concept of being in Christ. Not just him and us. Us in him. Look it up sometime. Do your own study before I give it. On In Christ, in God, in Jesus. See what you find. And I in him, okay, he abides in me and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. But if you abide in me, you are going to bear much fruit. Are we getting it? Let that sink in. Any good things we now do are really Christ doing them in us. That's key to understanding the end of this sermon the next time. And I think I better leave it there and then pick up next time. So we've covered a lot so far. We've all sinned. We've earned a death penalty. We've all been stained with Adam's sin. That's also now been taken care of. Christ's sacrifice is twofold. First, the death and the, and the blood that forgives the sin and all of that. And the other part of it, part two, is his life. His life bears fruit. His life is what produces goodness. His life is what's going to help us overcome. His life is what's going to make us worthy. You can try all you want in the world to be worthy, but Paul says, I can't stand myself. I'm carnal, sold under sin. He just said that. We just read it. Scripture is clear. It uses all three verb tenses about being saved, having been, being saved, shall be saved. As long as we're Staying close with God, abiding in Him. We don't have to fear not being. Therefore, God, cover that also, has already qualified us and made us worthy of that kingdom. I liken salvation's process to saving the drowning man. He was saved, being saved, and shall be saved. He cooperated with the lifeguard. Plus, I remind us all that God and Christ are one as one, are our Savior. And the fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ. We'll cover much, much more next time. And uh, we'll get into a whole lot more of... Uh, we'll get into a whole lot more of what our part is in the process of salvation. Father, we thank you so much for saving us in the process of it. We thank you so much for your promise to finish what you started in us. We thank you, Jesus, for your promise that not a single one will be taken out of your fingers in John 10. As long as we're your sheep and looking to you and watching you and hearing your voice and following your lead, we'll be there. Help us understand that we must indeed, though, be abiding in you. That's our hard work. That's our focus is to abide in you, Jesus Christ. Abide in you, Yeshua. And now ask your dismissal. Ask your blessing on everyone here. Keep them from the pandemics and diseases and problems. 
protect them from Satan who's angry. We thank you for all you've done for us and for saving us and offering us salvation. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.